So that was just a tiny snippet of um, kind of victim offender conference. Um, under the existing judicial system, victims and offenders may never meet each other. And that sense of, of um, balance and, and in the end, in, in this piece, Dane does community service or service to the victim and therefore restores a sense of relationship, a balanced relationship between him and his victim. So it's good to see how that works on the ground. Um, we have two speakers. Uh, let me remind them that they have 12 minutes each. <laughs> Tim Connors is a judge. He's used to, have it, used to having his way. <laughs> um, but we're going to start off with Belinda Doolin. Belinda is the uh, executive director of the Dispute Resolution Center. And for the past two years, she and other members of the center have been working on creating, uh, using restorative justice principles in, in the uh, Ypsilanti schools. Um, I always, when I do introductions for people, I always like to ask them for some personal bit of information. And in this case, I asked Belinda what drew her to dispute resolution in the first place. Why this work? Why not something else? And she said that and, and these are her words, she grew up in chaos on the mean streets of Detroit. And that, in her opinion, the people who most need the skills of conflict resolution are the people who are most at risk. And so she moved toward that field to be able to share that experience. She's a graduate of Cass Tech High School. And of Wayne State. Walking up here, I'll do a tiny bit more about the, the program in Ypsilanti, uh, Ypsilanti Community High School. It's the, in the second year, as I said, and there are trained mediators who work in a restorative center. And I remember um, I watched the video. There's a video of Belinda explaining the program uh, online, and she talked about one thing that struck me: that it was two students who had an altercation, and I believe it lasted, what, 30 seconds, I think it was. 30 second fight. And for that 30 second fight, those two students were suspended for the remainder of the school. <laughs> I can't imagine that. Um, I don't want to you know, venture too much personal stuff into this, but that means, of course, that they lose all that educational experience. And when they came back in the fall, there they were, woefully behind, and, and, and of course still angry. And so they went through the mediation process with Belinda and her colleagues. And at any rate, are you ready? Oh, <laughs> Belinda Doolin. ICPJ for inviting me to your annual meeting, and I thank you for your interest in the work of the Dispute Resolution Center. Uh, we're just a little small nonprofit here in Ann Arbor, and we service all of Washtenaw and Livingston counties. Uh, we're a small, I feel like we're a very small fish that produces big things um, for the community. Um, and as Ron said, that my passion, um, I feel very lucky that I went to college to, to study dispute resolution and then end up getting a job in that field. Um, but it is my absolute passion to help people um, understand the importance of resolving conflict in the most peaceful way and making decisions that can impact them for the rest of their lives. So I do believe that what we do in the community fits my personal values, and I think when I um, leave this earth, I hope that I've given something great, i left something great behind. Um, so tonight I was asked to talk to you about what we do at the high school specifically, but I want to let you know that the high school is just one piece of the work of the Dispute Resolution Center. We do things that involve just ordinary neighbor disputes. We call them the barking dog disputes. We work with families who are separating, divorcing, child custody. We work with 
Uh, kids who aren't getting to school on uh, consistently and on time, the attendance um, is poor. We work with families with kids who have special needs and they're in dispute with the school district. Um, we work with the courts with probate matters and the list goes on and on. So I encourage you to look at our website and, and you might um, have a need to use our service in a different kind of way. Uh, but at the school, um, a couple, of, actually a few years ago, it was about five years ago, I read the report, the school to prison pipeline, produced by Michigan ACLU, and it pretty much tore me to pieces uh, for a number of reasons. One, I know it's true. I, um, as my intro indicates, I'm from an urban city. I graduated from high school about 26 years ago, and that pipeline existed. Um, I remember being in middle school uh, with my friends, getting to high school, and they just seemed to disappear. So the work, um, the writings of Michelle Alexander is true. Um, I know it firsthand. I saw literally um, young boys that uh, we were playing tag on a school playground just weren't there in high school by 11th grade. Um, so I know kids were being suspended, I know we were being incarcerated, I know all of these things. So the, the information that we're reading, what seems to be a great aha, oh my God, I didn't know it was happening. I think I was living um, in the streets of Detroit. Um, so, uh, so I read this report and I realized that now people are going to pay attention. And then I thought, what can I do about it? And what can the this DRC do about it? And we have been thinking about working with Ypsilanti um, Public Schools at the time, trying to build a relationship with them. And two years ago, they actually gave us the green light and said, give, us, give it a try. If you know anything about Ypsilanti School District, and there was a merger, but just thinking about Ypsilanti School District when it was a separate district from Willow Run, the graduation rate continued to drop. The suspension rate was very high. And three years ago, um, the number of days of suspension were almost three times the number of kids at the high school. So if you can imagine, about 500 kids in the high school, there were 1,500 documented out-of-school suspension days for that school three years ago. Again, we had to do something. So the report um, supported the idea of restorative practices being an intervention that will address not only the relationship dynamic between students and between students and teachers, it also suggested that by doing so, we could keep kids in school. And we know, we all know the impact of um, dropout rates. We know when kids uh, are suspended enough, they eventually will drop out. Um, kids actually, actually give testimony in middle school that they get suspended enough, they get marginalized in the classroom, nobody cares, nobody pays attention, so they start thinking about dropping out in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. They just wait until about 15 to 16 to actually do it. But we also know that in Ypsilanti specifically, they drop out, but they don't go away. They stay in the community. If they go over to the jail and stay some time, they go back to the community. So it's important that education be a high priority and it's also important that we do what we can to keep them in school. So we thought that the restorative practices was our way of supporting that idea that we can keep kids in school. So two years ago we set up um, an infrastructure called the Restorative Center. Um, in that center the students are able to, um, any students who are having a problem, with another student or with a teacher, they can drop by the center and speak with Ms. Uh, now Ms. K, Ms. Keeley, who's um, employed there, um, and they can talk about what's going on. They can talk about who they're in conflict with. They can talk about ways to get it resolved, get it addressed and resolved. And we um, actually set up meetings, mediations, circles, conferences with the people who are um, involved in the problem and we give them an opportunity to talk about what's happening, why it happened, how they feel about it, the impact of the problem, and what they can do differently. So we're helping the school district make a shift in how they do business with discipline. Traditional discipline typically says that you broke a rule, you must be punished, and that usually means you get out of here. 
you get excluded from your school community. And while that might sound fun for some kids that get to hang out and play video games all day, what we know, and uh, Kathy White is here, she can attest to, do, to this, sometimes or oftentimes they get in trouble in the communities. They break into someone's home. They vandalize your property. They take out purses. They get in trouble. Uh, so it's really important that they stay in school. So the restorative practices helps us make a shift. We're not going to exclude the student from the community. We're going to keep them in the community. We're not concerned about the punishment of the crime, per se. We're concerned about restoring our, our school community and getting it in, back in balance and in harmony. So the questions that we ask are pretty straightforward and simple. What happened? How do you feel about it? What were you thinking when it happened? What can you do to change it? How can you repair the harm? And what's amazing about these circles is that the students respond to it. We might go around the circle one time and people are kind of quiet, kind of antsy, kids don't really want to talk in front of adults. But then someone speaks up and they, the, the conversation seems to go on and on. Even the person who has been harmed is a part of the circle. They talk about how it felt when it happened. They talk about how it feels at that moment. They talk about what they need to feel repaired or feel restored to move forward. And this conversation just seems to develop in such the most organic way between the individuals that they get to a solution that they can live with. We also include administrators of the school and teachers of the school in these circles because they too have been impacted. I don't think principals really enjoy suspending kids. That's all they know. That's what they rely on. It resolves the problem immediately for them. But the principal that we're working with now is beginning to see when that student comes back to school, they bring that problem back. So I need to repair my school. I need to repair the community within my school so that we can all move forward with the business of education. We include the teachers in the circle. Teachers do take the time to talk about um, how it impacted them and the other students in the class. The example that, the other example that Ryan brought up about the two students in the 30 second fight, and it was 30 seconds because the third student videotaped the fight, so we know that it was exactly 30 seconds. Um, they, the incident occurred in March, and they were suspended from school for the entire, for the rest of the school year. So they did not go back to school until September. Um, so that's a lot of classroom time that they missed. But what was amazing about that circle is that seven teachers participated. They gave up their prep time, lunch time, and participated in the circle. And that was really not expected. I did not expect that many teachers to want to come forth and support these two youngsters. But basically, they were so impacted by the, surf, uh, by the incident, and they needed to talk about it as well. So sometimes we forget that teachers have an emotional piece to them and it might get, uh, these incidents get in the way of them delivering the academics that they want to do. So they had a chance to talk to these young students about how it impacted them. But they also told the students that we missed you being in a classroom. That I know that you made a bad choice. That I know that this is not your character that we're not going to label you as a troublemaker for the rest of your time in this particular school. I am going to help you. And this was so important because these were seventh grade kids who had missed all of the subject matter to prepare for eighth grade. They came back in, sep in September in the eighth grade. So they, they offered to help these students uh, make up work or review work or tutor them so that they can be better prepared for the eighth grade work. They also talked about the impact on the other students in the classroom, students who said, will they ever come back? What's going to happen when they do come back? Would they fail the seventh grade and have to repeat it? Can we be friends again? Will they get into other fights? So we were able to put all this information on the table and really help these kids really see the magnitude of that 30 seconds of their life. 30 seconds of their life impacted about 15 people in the school, and they had no idea. 
So these two kids did receive that information, they, they accepted it, and they apologized not only to each other, they had not had a chance to do that either. They apologized to the teachers and the administrators of the building. And then they worked out how they would go forth and talk to their classmates about um, what happened and let them know that they put it behind them and that they're going to have an exciting and wonderful eighth grade experience. And all of that was because of a circle, a circle that didn't uh, punish them, a circle that was very supportive of them, the circle that was forgiving, understanding that when you're 12, 13 years old, you probably will do some very short-sighted, stupid things. And I have a 13-year-old boy, and they kind of do a lot of stupid things. <laughs> so I do understand that. Um, and it was very important that they felt reconnected to their school. And I think the, the blessing that I see in the restorative process is that people reconnect with other people. Sometimes um, at the high school, those other people are just the teachers, the administrators, the members of the community who support the program. Sometimes the connection is back with their parents. Uh, we learn in these circles that maybe the student and the parent haven't had a, a very healthy relationship. Sometimes they connect with resources of the community. Maybe they need medical care, mental health care. Sometimes they just need food. They need a place to wash their clothes. So a lot is accomplished in these circles because the circle is very supportive. It is a problem-solving process, but it's also very forgiving for the people who are, who are involved in the incident. Should I stop now, Ryan? Thank you. Have a couple minutes if you want to use them. We're not taking questions right now. Not now. Okay. So I'll um, turn it over, I guess, to the judge, and he'll talk about the judge.